So. I think it's best. Yeah, you, and you do better intros than I do. <laughs> okay, welcome everyone. Welcome to the Raise X Tech Safari founder. Ask me anything. Really excited for this session. Um. We're live. So uh, we actually can't see you at the moment. So I'd love to hear um, a bit from who's joining the session right now. Mm -hmm. Can everyone type into the chat wherever they are, their name, mm -hmm. maybe their company name and the, the country that they're calling in from? Yeah. That'd be very cool. cool. And as you do that and introduce yourselves, maybe we'll do some quick introductions. So you're a bit familiar with us, your... your uh, your hosts today. So I'm Caleb. I write a newsletter called Tech Safari, um, which covers tech in Africa. And I also actively invest in startups across the continent. So I see a lot of pitch decks, um, see a lot of talk to a lot of founders and help them raise. Um, and I am stoked to be here with Lisa Illingworth, commercial director at Raise. Um, Lisa will go a bit deeper into uh, what she's up to and the work she does. Oh, thanks, Caleb. Appreciate that. So I am the commercial director, as Caleb mentioned previously. I joined Ray's now over a year ago. So it's my anniversary three months this month of joining Ray's, which is very, very exciting. I'm South African um, and a previous founder. So I have got four businesses under the belt that I've started up. Uh, not all of those have survived. That definitely not survived some of those, the, the two-year hellfire that is startup world um but yes my one of the businesses that is still operational i stepped out of last year um and and gave the team a bit of breathing room to to you know reinvent the business called future proof um in their own in their own way without the starter co-founder sitting there looking over their, their shoulders every day and and that's when i decided i wanted to solve uh, african problems so not just south african problems african problems and then mm -hmm. joined joined raise as the commercial director thereafter so everything from sales marketing customer success service delivery it all sits underneath me uh, and raise as a business exists um, to raise Africa one startup at a time, uh, taking businesses from launch to liquidity uh, through equity management and legal and compliance services and software. So that's what Raise does, uh, and it's been it's been awesome working with you, Caleb, in, in you know reaching out and reaching further people in Africa and and helping them build better businesses for mm. themselves and and for the continent. Um, and it's, this is just another step in that journey of being able to do that. Totally. Um, firstly, Lisa, happy one month, uh, like one year anniversary um, or close to that. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I All survived right. as an employee for, for the first time in a very long time. I haven't been employed in informal employment for a very long time. So I'm like, I actually congratulate the people that hired me that they've actually managed yes. to stomach me for the last 12 months. <laughs> Because I am a bit of a hurricane, right? Yeah. It's like notoriously hard to hire people who are ex-founders because they're used to doing things their own way, having their own idea of what works. And so I think it really is a testament when like a founder comes, joins a company and loves it. Um, and on this side, yeah, Tech Safari, huge fan of Ray's. And like, I think the, the goal that we have is similar. Like the goal we both have is shared, which is we really want to develop the founder ecosystem and want to do more sessions like this um, to provide value for the great founders who, um, who want to build on, on our continent. So very pumped for this. Um, okay, so we're going to dive into value proposition, what a value proposition is, um, get into the theory of, of what, like how to craft a value proposition and then give you some real examples where we're all actually going to work together to, um, to assess a value proposition. Um, before we do that, we'll do two things. The first is I'll go through and see who's here, um, read through our comments and, and give you guys all shout outs. Um, if you haven't written up where you're calling from yet, uh, you know, write up your name, um, your company if you have one, um, or what you're doing if you have one, and where you're calling from. And then we're going to talk about why a value proposition even matters and why we're talking about it today. Um, and then from there, we'll dive into the session. So mm -hmm. some shout outs. We've got Michelle Ra Rackman at IQPay, South Africa. Welcome. Jibril Kala from Peslac Insurance from Kenya. Declan Cherry from South Africa. Ali Buckland from Skiza Education, Kenya. Priscilla Moses 
Tech Her Herfrica, that's a cool name. Um, Abraham Ophili, Perceptive Analytics from Nigeria. Ozzy from Wet Rays in Port Harcourt. Didn't know you lived there. That's cool. Um, Sci Africa. Ma uh, sorry, Mohammed, co founder of Sci Africa. Um, joining from Australia. Okay. Cool. Oh, Ozzy. I didn't say this, but I'm, yeah, I'm from Australia too. So nice to have you here. Um, Samantha from Rays uh, in Bangkok. AG uh, from Lagos. Uh, Arung Etta from Kids Transportation Service in Cameroon. Awesome. Um, Abo Aboya? No, sorry. Obo Oh, Ovayo. 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 <laughs> yes. My eyes are failing me. <laughs> I'm like, is that three O's? <laughs> uh, Ovayo. <laughs> From Zil. Uh, sorry. I'm going to do Zio Lise. Zio Lise? Zio Lisa, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to have to get used to this. If you're moving to the continent, Caleb, I you're know. really going to have to brush up on your African, really African languages. Yes. I'll, I'll be better next time. <laughs> um, Harmony yeah. from Nibotics Nigeria. Kevin from Young African Catalysts uh, from Copenhagen. Awesome to have you. And Young African Catalysts is an awesome, awesome organization. So cool that you're doing that program. Oya Bamiji from Damilare from Nigeria. Dean from Cape Town. Dean Joffe from South Africa. Peter from Pundit in Ghana. Um, awesome. Will Broad from AWK IntelliSense. Uh, Kenya, Abiola from Shiga Digital um, from London, and Jonathan from Lip World. Good to see you here, Jonathan. Um, and uh, Abayo giving me a, making me feel better about my failed attempt at your name. <laughs> <laughs> by the end of this, Zulu Hulu Master Zulu, right? We're going to get you talking some Zulu by the end of this. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. And uh, Lydia from Kenya, T from Rwanda. Awesome. I feel like we're all acquainted. Um, we all kind of know each other's names. Uh, so maybe we can get into a bit of the ethos of this session. Um, I might just ask this question, Lisa, like, why does a, what is, why does a value proposition matter? Why are we even talking about it today? Mm. So it's, it's really interesting that, that um, you know, value propositions are, are kind of the highlight of this because most startup founders don't even think about a value proposition. You know, when you, you start up as a, as a founder in, in this ecosystem, you kind of just, you spot an opportunity and then you try and capitalize on it. You, you build something, you go to market, you get your first customers, um, but you, you know, you don't have an, an, a deliberate cycle of understanding what feedback you're getting to it and the messaging that's coming back. And a value proposition is a, a wonderful way of filtering that feedback into what's valuable and, and retaining it, and then what's mm. not valuable and discarding it. And that's mm. just very, very basically what a value proposition would be. It's saying, what value am I proposing to my potential customers? Mm. And that often gets lost in the noise of just trying to stay alive in those first two years, like we mentioned, and, and then, you know, when you start growing, you, you often end up in that, in that Bermuda Triangle of growth, you know, where most companies actually get lost in that growth stage because they mm. just, they don't know how to grow. And often the value proposition, when you are disseminating it from the mind of the founder, uh, mm. you're actually creating a cornerstone document that then guides the rest of the organization. Because too many times the way businesses then try and grow is everything still sits in the mind of the founder and that then gets mm. passed down potentially to three or four people that are, are close to the founder and, and it kind of stays there. But when you're starting to create a legitimate value proposition, it can then be cascaded down into an organization without it necessarily being centralized still with the founder. So you can get growth and you can get scale um, mm. by building out something that's really valuable to the rest of the business. And I mean, as I was mentioning to you earlier, when we hire people into raise, the, one of the first documents that we give them is our value proposition Bible. It's to say, this mm. is the problem that we're solving and this is who we're solving it for. And these are the ways in which we're going to solve them. And it's mm. a way of niching your business from the outset so that yeah. you understand who you're speaking to and why are you speaking to them. Um, but a lot of founders don't go through that 
that deliberate process of taking it out of their heads and putting it down. Um, and then, you know, you you become the blocker to growth. Yeah. That's awesome. I think that's like, that's a really cool overview of, um, yeah, of like why it happened, like why we need a value prop and, and what happens when you don't have one. Um, I'll give you my take on why I think a value prop is important, maybe from a VC perspective. Um, you know, like this week, reviewing a lot of pitch decks, because um, I'm out here in Cote d'Ivoire and have been spending time with a lot of founders here. And I think um, in general in VC, like I, it, when you build a startup or you build something, um, you need to you need to actually earn your right to exist because a lot of products out there, a lot of startups just exist for the sake of it. Um, and the startups that actually win are the ones that earn their right to exist or hold that space. Um, it's easy to get carried away and like, wow, I really love building or I really like yeah. this tech yeah. or yeah. I feel like I'm the right person for the job. But actually none of that really matters unless you're solving a core no. problem. Um, yeah, and exactly. you're not going to build something very impressive if you don't. Yeah. So like, no. it's kind of like the value prop is like why you exist. Yeah. And it ke keeps bringing you back to, to what you should be doing in the direction you should be focusing on because founders have this opportunity awareness that's just switched on all the time. So they're just mm. seeing opportunity everywhere. And the, the value proposition Bible gives you the ability to say yes to the right opportunities and no to the wrong opportunities as well. It keeps mm. you nice and filtered and facing in the right direction because founder ADHD is a real thing. Yeah. And like, uh, I have a, I have one anecdote and then I'll, we'll dive into the session, but I have a friend who runs a, um, like a kind of a venture studio, uh, in Australia though. And he would get back in the bull market. He would get a pitch deck every month from the same two founders, but it was a completely different thing. So it was like, you know, Duolingo mm -hmm. for like Russian. And then it was like, we're going to do a FinTech and then we're going to do like an education platform. Same two <laughs> founders, a completely different deck each month. Um, and these guys are just like, we see an opportunity here. We see an opportunity there. Or like, this is blowing up. Um, but really like at the end of the day, they just, they stayed in their jobs. Um, they didn't end up building something, but they just wanted to for the sake of it. And I think that that can really show when you're building something just because you want to build something. There's nothing wrong with it, but to expect it to get funded and to grow into something really, like really significant and important, it's very rare that it happens. And so like having this clear idea of the problem you're solving and why and kind of mm -hmm. sticking to that um, and, and updating that is really important. So, mm. And then saying no to everything else that doesn't look like that. Yes. Yeah. Saying laser focused. Yeah. yeah exactly. Awesome. Um, just to shout out Shanice as well, who is running level. I've met Shanice in New York, so it's nice to have you here. And Sophia from Tabby Academy in Nigeria. Um, hey. Cool. All right. Should we dive in, Lisa? I think we should, um, and and I'm going to give you a bit of a backstory as to why we're doing this exercise. I, uh, when I founded Future Proof, you know, I come from education. So my backstory being that I was um, an educator, I was a teacher, uh, not loving everything that's taught to kids these days because some of it is is completely irrelevant to the world in which they're entering into. And we just, we're just putting lots and lots of knowledge in their heads and not actually giving them something that's real and tangible. And then, you know, started businesses and went back thinking, hang on a second, I've got, I've got a qualification in education. I've got a second qualification in, in curriculum design, wanting to build out Future Proof, which is um, a business that is designed to introduce entrepreneurship education to children from the age of five years old. So, um, went about and built the curriculum exactly like you said, build the bright, shiny things. Um, you know, love building, give, gives you such a dopamine kick. And mm. then eventually started taking it to market. We ran our first program at a school and the, the headmistress just absolutely loved it and then rolled it out across the rest of the, the group of schools and then started to build out into a business. And, you know, the, those first couple of customers, you you don't quite know how you, you get them, but you just, you, they kind of arrive, right? Generous mm -hmm. friends, family, and fools. Um, so you, you, those are the, you, you, usually your first customers, and that's exactly where you should get your first customers from because you don't have to get them to know, to like, um, or to trust you. They already have those three things done. So when you're building out a, a product, they know, they like, they trust. You don't have to convince them. And, and that was what, what happened with Future Proof. So we built out all of the things. We ran programs. We got kids excited. We got testimonials. We did every, you know, all the stuff that you, you think you know you should be doing um, to build a business. And, and we did that. And then um, I started taking like meetings with people and, 
it was generally headmasters and headmistresses that were running school. So we were doing that. And I was taking these meetings and taking these meetings, but nothing was closing. Nothing was closing. I was seeing all the buying behavior and buying signals from these people in these meetings, but nothing was closing. And I could not understand why the interest was there. I got the meetings. I did the, pres the demos, the presos. I gave them all the testimonials, the referrals, everything. Why am I just not closing this? Mm -hmm. And it was only when I actually started sitting down and listening to what was being said to me, instead of me trying to sell so much, me actually stepping back and listening to what was being asked for. And Future Proof was pitched as entrepreneurship education, the supplementary to the national curriculum uh, that you could add on to your program. It was time light, it was all of those things. And I was pitching it almost in a philanthropic um, theme or tone is, you know, you should be giving kids more. And, and that's sure it landed well, but it wasn't closing. It wasn't, it wasn't needing to be closed. And then I stepped back and actually listened to what I was being told. And the questions that were being asked were, okay, well, is this going to be bespoke to our school or are you going to offer it to everybody else's? Um, you know, how are there ex exclusivity? Is there restraint of trades? Um, can you build us something that's bespoke just for us? How do we protect that? And starting to listen to that messaging that's coming back, realizing at the end of it, you know, um, given that time to just think deeply about this was that, the schools are a business in themselves. They have to create a unique offering in the market. They have mm -hmm. to niche themselves and they have to define why people should come to them as parents and spend their money as opposed to the other school, which is 200 meters down the road. Mm -hmm. Why would they come into it? And the value proposition to the heads of schools then changed. And it changed to this is how you niche yourself in a saturated education market. Mm -hmm. And that shift in what problem am I solving and for whom? Yes, entrepreneurship education is brilliant and it should be in every single school around the globe because it's too late when you leave school to try and figure it out. Mm. Yes, but I wasn't solving the problem for the school. And as soon as I realized what the problem was and then how to frame it, it changed everything it changed our marketing it changed our sales and it changed the trajectory of the business and even for then going into like pitches for for funding for investment um that that value proposition that key to unlocking and closing deals mm -hmm. suddenly then became that, that the gateways opened for the business so this is why i'm so passionate about making yeah. sure founders understand the value proposition because what you sell is very different to what is the problem that you solve. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, that's such a that's such a good introduction into like like a real example of why um, like why it really matters to refine that value prop. Um, but Lisa, just to like just to refine that a bit and just like double tap on something. What was your like pitch before you had a value prop, mm -hmm. a clear value prop, and then what was your pitch after? Like, what were you right. saying to um, to these like customers before and after? Absolutely. So I was walking in there and I was saying to them, um, you know, entrepreneurship education is the future of, of where education is going. Um, it's too late to start it later on. Therefore, it should be started at a school level. All the research as to why entrepreneurship education should be introduced at schools that then differentiates a late stage entrepreneur to an early stage entrepreneur all like all the backup behind it to say this is why you should be teaching entrepreneurship education for the future of South Africa for giving people more you know opportunities to create their own income all of those like and the things that we know inherently but the school cares about that absolutely but it's not solving a problem for them no so no, it no. went from these are this is the reasons why you should have entrepreneurship education as part of your offering to this is why you should have entrepreneurship education as part of your offering because this is going to be the differentiator for you in the market mm, okay so you okay so you turn it from like this is why we should do it to this is what you get from it this is exactly like correct yeah exactly awesome. this is what how you benefit from this yeah awesome so yeah. good
Awesome. Shall we get into, I mean, that, that's a really cool like insight into how changing the, the positioning of what you're doing, understanding mm -hmm. the problem and translating that to an offering, like change your business. Um, let's show everyone on the call how they can do that too. Like let's okay. dive into some of that theory of, on like on how they can refine their value prop. On how they can do their value proposition, definitely. Okay. So that's the first thing that you need to understand is what are you who are you solving a problem for and what is that problem? Very, very specifically. Um, and so we did a little exercise and I'm going to show you in the kitchen a little bit. So I'm actually going to give you a, an insight into the kitchen. It's a little bit of a messy kitchen. So please, please be, be gracious with us. Um, but we ran our entire team through this exercise. This is a Figma board and I'm literally going to show you the exercise that we did. And I took the team through this um, of understanding um, defining who you are solving a problem for. Um, and we call that our keystone species. So in um, biomimicry, um, so, you know, when the, the corporate world mimics what happens and goes on in nature in order to create sustainable ecosystems, um, you have a single species by which your entire ecosystem operates and that's called your keystone species. So we defined, and it's an ideal customer profile, you might relate to it, we call it a keystone species. Because cool. we've, we've got a keystone species that, that everything else revolves around. And your ecosystem doesn't exist without this. So you might have other uh, customers within it. We call them ecosystem builders. But if this keystone species doesn't exist, the rest of your, your business doesn't exist. And so we really went in and defined who is our keystone species. And we call this person Bella. She has a name. You can see that it says. Bella is a first-time survivalist founder. Um, and... And we talk about Bella in our business. It, she's a person, you know, she's an actual human that we're solving problems for. And that's across the business. That's not just sales and marketing and customer success. That's across the business. That's engineering, that's product, that's management. What are you doing to solve Bella's problem today? And then understanding Bella and the keystone species, you start to understand what are her burning pain? What is she dealing with every single day that keeps her awake at night? And if you're solving the, the deeper the pain, the more people are willing to pay for it, right? And, and the less you are, you fall into the vitamin pill category. And you understand what I mean by the vitamin pill category, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we call them vitamins in Australia, but yes. Uh, <laughs> like vitamin, right? vitamin and painkiller. Um, yes. But maybe you can exactly. explain that analogy for the people on the call. Lisa. Okay. So yeah, a, a vitamin pill is something that you would take every single day. Um, it's you know good for your health. You know it's good for your health, but it's a bit of a grudge purchase. You know, you're taking it in order to prevent some kind of future uh, impending ailment. So you know, uh, sorry, someone wants to to read our disorganized founder um, there. I hope that helps. <laughs> so the vitamin pill is then to, to take something in case it happens. So like buying insurance, why would you take insurance? Well, in case something bad would happen to you. Um, by the way, South Africa is um, one of the highly high saturated insurance markets in the world. Um, a lot of bad stuff happens to South Africa. So you have to insure your car and your house and, you know, your life and everything. So you do that, but it's a grudge purchase. It comes off your account every single month. And you're like, oh, I have to pay for insurance. But then your painkiller is something that is happening to you now. The need is imminent. You're feeling it in a very visceral, real way. And so you'll pay whatever it takes to take that pain away immediately. Um, yeah. And so businesses, yeah. when you're looking for a, a market positioning and you're trying to identify what is your primary value proposition First of all, go into a really deep dive of who are you solving problems for? That's to start off with. Really understand their psyche and then go into what is their pain? What, what, are you, what pain are you solving for them? Um, and that's, and that's yeah. what we did. That's so the awesome. team went through this exercise and we you know, built out the profile of Bella. Um, and we did it, instead of looking at the classic demographics, we lo looked at it in three different ways. What is Bella doing? What is Bella thinking? And what is better, better feeling? And that immediately starts to frame your messaging as well. So what, what are you going to say to Bella? Okay, because this is what she's doing. This is what she's thinking. And this is what she's feeling. 
And that gives you the psychographics, not just the demographics of the person that you're, you're identifying. And this was a team exercise. So all our team put together these little post-it notes on here, and then we voted on the ones that were, were most prominent. And, and because we've got people that are talking to our Bellas, we're saying, what have you heard? In conversations with these people, what have they actually said to you? So taking it back to the example of Future Proof, stop, stop trying to, to interpret what you're hearing. Just listen to what you're hearing. Just, just take it as at face value. Um, my grandfather was an artist. We were talking about this earlier. My grandfather was an artist. And he used to say to me, stop drawing what you think you see and draw what you see. Mm. Right? Mm. What does that mean? I, sorry, I'm still trying to decide. That, like. <laughs> <laughs> so instead of instead of listening to what you think you're hearing, listen right. to what you're hearing from your customers. Hmm. Verbatim. Don't try and filter it through your own perception. Listen to what they are saying to you. Hmm. Yeah. Because we 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 come with founder bias, so we're like we, we just want everybody to love our, our products and our services, and we can't understand why they don't. And then we mm. take it personally when they when they don't when you're pitching something to them. I mean, how how could you not invest in my business? It's amazing. Why why wouldn't you do that? Mm. But it's like when people are giving you feedback and giving you questions, stop filtering it through your perception. Listen to what they're actually saying to you. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, awesome. So, um, yeah, and that's what we did. So that was the value proposition. So in, in the first the first step in it was understanding who's your keystone species. Who are your ecosystem builders around that? Okay. So, you know, who else exists in this ecosystem that helps support how this ecosystem grows? Okay. What challenges are they facing underneath that? And then we started to give them also profiles, give them the names, um, give them profiles within that. Um, and, and the team was involved in this exercise. And then out of that, we came our, our core value proposition Bible, which is this. Uh, that, that we've gone through. And we stripped out all of this in order to give people the Value Proposition Bible template. Um, but this was, this was our, our, um, our end result, was you know, what do we want to do? What do we want to achieve? What does Bella need? What is going to, to kill Bella's pain? And that's you know, when we raise Africa one startup at a time. Um, and that's, that's how awesome. it was solidified. Yeah, exactly. Cool, cool to see this brainstorming. Um, Lisa, like, how would you recommend that? Because, I mean, this this is a, a very team exercise, right? Like, you get a lot of perspectives, a lot of opinions, um, yeah. a lot of people together thinking about this problem. It, mm -hmm. Let's say that we have a solo founder here or, like, someone just working on their side hustle. How would you say that they could do this thought process or this this exercise? So the first thing I would do is is take stuff from what you do know. Um, and that's kind of... Um, it's an educational term, educational theory um, brought about by Lev Vygotsky, where it's you move from what you know to what you don't know. Um, it's called the zone of proximal development. Um, I know that you go like, there's some theory for you. So start yeah. with what you know. <laughs> mm. And what you think you know. So go, this is what I know and better down with data behind it. Mm -hmm. This is what I know. Then move out into this is what I think I know, mm -hmm. right? So these are my assumptions. This is kind of what I think I know. And then outside of that, then you move to, this is what I don't know. And then outside of that is, is definitely what you know you don't, or what you know you don't know, and then what you don't know, which you're mm -hmm. never going to get to. So yeah. it's kind of just going, let's start off with what I think I know and, mm -hmm. and back it up with data. If there's no data, then move it out one, one block. Then if there's, it still doesn't move out again, just start off with what you, what you definitely know that's supported by data. That's awesome. And then I might also add just a few a few tactics as well. I think that's really cool starting with the stuff you know for sure from your experience or from like from seeing it play out. I also think just on on data, like when we think about data, um, it's important to like a lot of people will take stats from online or like total addressable market, a hundred billion dollars. Um, and that's not really as valuable as like data you've had from insights, from like work you've done, from like real like interactions that you've seen play out. I think that that's a bit more important. Um, another cool way to do this is like you actually bring your customer into the session. Um, mm -hmm. You have them there and you, you work through some of these questions with them. You get them like talking about their pain points. 
um, and you have them on board when you go through this process. And then I think that gives you like the clearest insight. Um, my last company, Entry Level, which is an ed tech as well. Um, we had, when we started, we had like three really big, like two hour sessions with everyone who is in startups and then people who are educators and then people who are recruiters. And in those sessions, we'd ask them a bunch of questions, get them brainstorming, talking about like the different problems they have. Um, with all that data, we summarized like a list of like 10 potential ideas. And we went through that list and launched. Um, and idea number four was entry level, which is the company that's, that's still running now. So um, right. yeah, that's, that's another way you could go into like that brainstorming process. Very nice. Yeah, listen to people, listen to what they're saying. Um, are we are we ready to 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 do that? Are we ready Let's to do start it. like doing some panel beating? Let's do it. Let's do some <laughs> are we starting with Ray's? Are, are we gonna? I, I think we should. I think yeah. we should start. Yeah, yeah. With, we'll, we'll blitz it, and then we've okay. got two people on our on our on our panel today, and that's Lynn and Lekan. Um, and they're joining us shortly. And they, they, hi guys. Lynn, unfortunately, um, she's got a, a, a prince in her throat. It's not a frog, it's a prince. Um, she's got a prince in her throat. And so she's going to struggle a little bit. So she's going to do some typing um, for us in our chat uh, when we go through those. But Lekan, Caleb, Lynn, you, we're putting Razor's value prop under the spotlight now. Um, and I'm going to run through our value prop Bible with you very quickly, very quickly, because it can be very laborious. Um, but maybe you guys can give us a little bit of insight into how we can panel beat Razor's value proposition to get better. Mm -hmm. um, you know, none of us are, are beyond reproach when we're growing as startups, and it's always going to be amazing to have and and guys on the chat as well if there's stuff mm. there that you think that you know you want to add or you know that that we could possibly look at that would be really incredible so almost like a, a peer mentoring session this is like a um a collaborative value prop order body shop um, yeah. <laughs> this is, um, like i feel like we benefit the most from like from outsiders perspective right so like people who aren't in the business and so everyone on this call like uh, we want you to participate, you know, give us your thoughts um, as we go through this, like share insights you've got. Um, and yeah, and let's dig deep into, into these companies. Let's panel okay, beat perfect. a bit. Let's panel beat it a little bit. Okay, so our core value proposition Bible, um, we identified the, what the purpose of this document is. And that was important because you're trying to disseminate it, you know, almost asynchronously to the rest of your team. So what was our vision? We were raising Africa one start at a time. What do we want to go to market? We want to build oh, traction with our customers. Yes. Are you meant to be sharing your screen right now? I, I am sharing. Is I can't sharing? see it. Can, no. oh, I don't know I'm if it's sharing. just the speakers. We can't see it, but. Um... Oh, that's weird. Okay. Check. Let's try now. Can you see now? Nope. Still not. That's yeah. really bizarre. I don't know. Maybe my team can help because I can see my shared screen at the bottom there. Oh, hello. Oh, yes. Now. Oh, there we go. Amazing. Okay, guys. So can we see that? Okay. Yeah. Right. Um, so this was the, the first little section was just context. Um, and this was important. We put three questions in here. After reading this document, you should be able to answer these four questions. Um, do you understand the context and the, you know, which African founders and their startups are operating? Do you see what we are doing at Raise as a key lever to intervening in this context? Can you empathize with Bella and her challenges? Do you see how your role fits in the mechanics of delivering the products and services and tools to Raise? And that was important for us guys, because we wanted to make sure that this document served the purpose of taking what was in the founder and the management team's heads and putting it out to the ecosystem. So I'm not going to go through each of these. This is really, really detailed. I mean, this is like a 37-page document. Um, but, you know, we built out the mission. We built out the vision of that. Then we looked at the context of, of where we found ourselves in Africa and the context specifically that Bella is finding herself in, what the failure rates, the missing middle that we refer to, you know, where there's some really amazing unicorns and then everyone else is kind of in the startup phase and there's this missing middle of of developing businesses in Africa. Um, so then we looked at some of the issues around friction with laws. And this is obviously speaking to context. Then we looked at our go-to-market. Okay, so how Raise go to, goes to market. What is our competitive strategy, right, within that? And we looked at all the direct and indirect competitors to Raise. 
um, being able to understand that is, is incredibly important. Um, and please, guys, you know, as founders, we might like to live in, in Never Never Land where we think we've got no competitors. You always have some kind of competitor. And if they're not competing directly, they're competing for the same portion of your customer's wallet. So understand who they are. And if they, you know, people, your customer's going to spend money, are they going to spend money on you? And why would they spend money you on you and not somebody else? Mm. Um, so then we looked at, you know, what, what are we making? What promises are we making? Why, why would people love raise um, a product, the goals of each of those products, and then the business model that would then support that underneath it. Okay. How to create the competitive advantage against our customers. But if you don't understand your competitors, if you don't understand your competitors, you're not going to be able to create your competitive advantage. Brand, look and feel where we went, where we were, where we, we, we are now, much sexier, much nicer, because now we understand what is Bella reading? What is Bella looking at? What does she want to see? Um, then the African markets and really getting into some of the absolute data behind that and the context within it. Um, Bella, <laughs> for those of you who've watched the, the latest Black Panther, this should, should be um, <laughs> familiar to you. Um, and then, yeah, into some of the really, really hard things that she's she's suffering from. Our go-to-market, how are we going to acquire and retain customers? A market-driven approach. So we use a market-led sales GTM strategy for B2Cs, and we outline what that B2C strategy is. And then we have a B2B strategy on top of that as well, and what that B2B strategy is, um, and then our core solution and our core products underneath that. And that's how we meet Bella's Bella's need. And that's our value proposition, Bible. Nice. That's great. Right. How, do we, how do we even like dive into that? There's so much. <laughs> There's so much underneath so that. Much. I agree. It was and it's just like a real like a big scan through. I wonder if there's something that maybe we've missed um mm. within that. If, well, can, if you guys are building out value propositions. Uh, yes. I have a few thoughts. So maybe like as we go, like if people have comments or questions or things that they can get into about the value proposition. Um, mm -hmm. like leave them in the comments. Um, mm -hmm. Is it possible to get that back up, Lisa? Or Yes, of course. As as so one thing share. that came up is I think competitors are one of the best way to think about what you actually do in your value proposition, right? Like you're right. thinking about who exists and, and like where the space that you should take up and why you should exist. Yeah. Um, it would be cool to go to the competitor part of that. I'm, um, I'm really deep diving into that now for you. There you go. Oh, I can't see uh -huh. that. I'm just about to let it. Why would you let me share again? There we go. Nice. Got it. Great. Oh, cool, cool, cool. Um, so my question here, maybe it's a hard question, but um, mm -hmm. why isn't... Okay, cool. Why isn't Excel on here? That's a really good question, is why Excel don't we... Comp yeah, mm -hmm. because that's right. So it's it's probably the, the first place that you're ever going to build out your first cap table is, is Excel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Within that. Um, maybe it was a little bit of arrogance. Maybe it was a little bit of arrogance to say maybe, you know, <laughs> Excel's just, they're not on par, right? But it's yeah. if you, you know, if you're paying for cap table software, Bella is already in that stage of growth where she's gone beyond the Excel spreadsheets. So, she's now moved into some kind of paid cap table management software um, or some kind of equity management software. So she's already entered into the market and she's gone past the point where Excel is, is gonna, gonna cut it. Okay. Cause, okay, just to push back on that. Like, I think that mm -hmm. every, every cap table I see whenever we look at like a cap table, it's on Excel. Um, mm -hmm. Pre-seed founders generally don't have management software. Like only a handful I know have like moved on to Carter, let's say. Yeah. Um, and founders are scrappy and don't want to pay for things. So mm. um, I wonder like which parts, I, I feel yeah. like a lot of founders don't, you, even at entry level, right? We don't actually, no, we do now. But up until like our seed round, which was a 2 million round, we didn't use a, mm. a software because we didn't feel like we needed to mm -hmm. to distribute equity it was all done manually um because it was cheaper mm -hmm. so i just mm -hmm. wonder like how yeah um 
when it comes to value prop and perhaps like this is where you've really refined the customer to like post a certain round but um when it comes to value prop i just wonder if uh like one of one of the like there's a value proposition there but people's propensity to spend isn't as high no that's true they and, and sometimes their purchasing power is not that high either yeah um they're, they're kind of in that stage like we said the bermuda triangle of growth where most businesses get lost is the, they're sort of in that stage you know of we we need we know we need to pay for something that's a little bit better because yeah. you know excel's messy and it's it's not it's and it, it's full of human error because it's created by a human um, mm. and i think what we've noticed is it's the the burning pain that's being solved is typically when somebody's excel spreadsheet has got to the point where they now no longer know how much equity of their own business they they own interesting okay yeah yeah so as soon as they get to that point the value of raise is is so pertinent to them mm. it's so easy to see oh you know i don't even know how much of my business i own myself because it's all in this excel spreadsheet that's a mess i just need mm. you guys to, to sort it out for me yeah yeah interesting okay so very that's, good well spotted that's very that's good. a good point yeah i think i think that's right that's where you like you refine the customer into a, a segment of like has raised this much and is, is ready for the next stage exactly um, yeah. and that's the way how we spot our customer as well as soon as they start dropping that sort of language in, that's how we know it's immediately yeah. that's a bella. Um, so that's it's it's definitely like the kind of behavior that we're looking for, and and you can literally tell that to you know the marketing, the sales team, the customer success team, the, the delivery team, and they can listen to a customer and they can hear those words and be like, oh, I get it, I get mm. it now. Um, so that's really good. Thank you for that spot. Um, but maybe we should we should give somebody uh, yeah, other yeah. people you know um, a, a shot. Lynn Lekan, is there anything that you guys saw there that you know you could possibly help raise with? <laughs> no, well, well, I, well okay. I can't really talk. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to, if you want to chat in, put it in the chat, so no, that's fine. Um, but, it, it, you know, even people on the audience, guys, is there anything here that you think Ray's could do better um, in their value proposition? Um, so, so yeah. Um, and then, Margaret, you've just asked if we can pop the, the value proposition link into the chat. Absolutely. The team will get it through to you now, um, to the, the templates that we built this out on. Um, but let's let's give Lekhan a chance, maybe. Lekhan, do you want to, do you want to get into, um, to, to, what's it? Give me your business name. Um, just, yes. Debt to finance. Debt to finance. All right. I'm going to stop sharing our value proposition and let's see. And let's see. Maybe we can help and panel beat yours a little bit. Now that Ray's has been under the yeah. spotlight, right? Looks like you just so, got a, okay, list, a, a new person on your wait list. Congrats. Yeah. Yeah. You just okay. scored a new customer. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, so the, um, uh, the link, royal, royalties, the link. royalties, uh, referral fee. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Caleb, yeah. I, I had sent, I sent the link in the chat section, so if okay. I bring okay. it up. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, I the name Better Finance. Yeah. The name was supposed to like be mysterious. Like, why Better Finance? So we have a culture in Nigeria. Yeah. Um, November, December, at the end of the month, at the end of the year. Um, we call it debt to December, meaning all the monies you've made in the entire year. You, I mean, and there's a lot of concerts that happen in that period, David O concert, Bonaboy concert. You get to splurge all your money. So uh, you don't use your own money or you borrow loans. So the idea was like, okay, I'm going to talk about, the product is going to be talking about debt and debt finance. So, I mean, this is a part of finance that people don't want to talk about when it comes to debt, right? Debt, debt, debt. People will try to avoid that conversation. But before I go into the product, I just want to drop a bit of some stats. I mean, we have over 103, 103, no, 1,003 lending companies in Nigeria, 800 microfinance banks, 330 commercial banks, and over 173 approved fintechs in Nigeria. 80% of people and businesses and individuals in Nigeria borrow from friends and families. And the inflation in Nigeria has grown by 100% in the last two years. 
seventy percent of loans is inevitable would be you would default. Seventy percent of people would default on their loans. Fifty percent of Nigerians have more than one loan account. Fifty percent at least. At least, so out of 10, five, I have two, three loan accounts, right? Um, 20 to 25% of non, we have 20 to 25% of non-performing loans in Nigeria. Five trillion naira in loans have been given out. And all of this figure, you realize that there's so much lending company, there's so much loans, there's so much people that have so much loans across multiple organizations, across multiple payment dates. Now, what's the idea? The idea is to help data finance to help you say okay it's okay it's okay to splurge your money it's okay to borrow money and spend it but it's not okay to not have a sense of where these monies are how to consolidate them how to manage them and emphasis on the 70 percent default rate 70 percent of people will default on their loans so the mm -hmm. idea of data finance is first to help you aggregate this debt right this debt into one platform so from fintech from microfinance from commercial banks aggregate them into one platform. Let's have an overview of it first, right? Mm -hmm. Then secondly, the idea is to analyze them. So now we understand that you have a 50,000 real loan from REM money and you have another 1 million from GT Bank and you have another from microfinance. So when is the repayment date for these loans? What's the interest rate? Do you, do you understand what it means to have an overdrawn interest rate? That, I mean, mm -hmm. your regular interest rate is 3% per month. Your overdrawn interest rate is 2.5% per month. Then inflation obviously is there also. Do you have an understanding of all of that? We aggregate we analyze i mean that's where ai would come in thank god we're in the chat gpt era so we can easily plug that in and help you make sense of it then we educate you on that then most importantly we give you an option to refinance so i mean after i've told you oh we can make sense of the debt and everything there are three options where you can refinance on debt finance right there's mm -hmm. um there's an option for where we connect you to side gig side jobs i mean Especially if you're a remote worker, God bless you, you should be able to get the side gig to prop up your income. Um, there's a reskilling option and there's a marketplace, there's a debt marketplace. So remember I said 80% of individuals borrow from friends and families. So if you have friends and families within your network or colleagues within your network that are willing to give you the money to settle the loan for a period of time, debt finance will help you rearrange the share and say, normally you were supposed to pay this loan for six months or one year, but now with this additional income, we can reduce that to make it more comfortable for you. So mm. emphasis. Aggregate. Like, uh, let's, uh, let's round out in, in the next 30 seconds. So yeah, I'm almost, done. To die. almost done. So yeah. emphasis, emphasis for data finance helps you aggregate your debt, analyze your debt, educate you, mm. refinance it, and eventually help you settle this debt. So you become a sane debt person. I mean, if you don't want debt, fine. But if you are going to do debt, do it right. So that's the right. general idea of debt finance. Mm. Okay. Yeah. I've yeah. got I've got a, a bunch of, of, of things to, <laughs> to add to this. Um, so I am I'm not your ideal customer. I'm not your keystone species, right? Um, <laughs> so so I think one of the things that's that and I, 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 you know I've got your, your your pitch deck open in front of me it's not letting me share that i don't know why um but maybe you want to put it up it's just saying like who is that keystone species this and you've given us some of the understanding of but it's it's people that are over debted multiple and i think it's now defining that they've got multiple they're getting debt from multiple lenders um you know in they haven't necessarily maybe got some financial education um so and it's really going into like the psychographics of this person. So it's saying, okay, what are they doing? They're, they're probably borrowing from one person to pay off the interest loans on the other, on the, from the other person. Yeah. Like, so what does that behavior look like? What are they doing to, to service those debts from different places? Basically like your debit order is going off on the first of this month and then the other one's going off on the third and you're moving money around from one debt to the other just to, do you know the, the behavior, right? So what yes. are they thinking? They're thinking, oh my God, how am I going to get out of this? They're probably already starting to be blacklisted on things. Yeah. Their credit rating yeah, is definitely. really low. So you, what, what are they thinking? They're thinking, how can I get out of this hole that I'm in? And what are they feeling? They're feeling helpless, right? They're feeling like they, they, there's no one to turn to. And it's probably really embarrassing, right? That it they're is. probably quite... So here we go. So you've got a customer that's probably not going to stick up their hand and say, oh, that's me. 
I'm I'm too much in debt. <laughs> so you're gonna have to find out where they these types of people showing this type of behavior congregate. Uh, what do they read? Um, or are they the type of people that are just kind of sweeping it under the carpet and hoping it goes away? Um, yep. And understanding that kind of psychology of your keystone species will then start to develop your messaging through it. But what your pitch deck has done is it's definitely shown me immediately the solution to the problem, which is great, but it hasn't shown me who you're solving the problem for. That's the only, yeah. that's what I'm missing is, is understanding that. And what is the market size? What is the market size that you can capitalize on, on that? Mm -hmm. Maybe to add to that, like, I think it doesn't tell me, like, it tells me the problem, um, which is like people, you know, like in December, it's a wild month. People spend a lot of money and, you know, people need a hand uh, managing their debt in general. It doesn't tell me where people go to solve that problem. And I think, you know, there's always a way that people try to solve that problem. And I'd really like, I'd be really curious to know, like, what do they do usually to, to solve that problem of having debt? Yeah. Um, and like, what's the go-to behavior? Um, and then how will you work around that? Because I think behavior change, which is like, okay, now instead of going to your, like, yeah. I don't know, your parents or your uncle, like, um, go hop mm -hmm. on this app. It's kind of like, I think it, like understanding where people go to solve that problem will inform um, how you get this in front of them. Um, yeah, so I think that's like the first thing. And then the second one is, um, yeah, I think when you start something, you want to solve one problem, um, like one core problem, mm -hmm. and then branch out from that. And I think, yeah. uh, especially when it's early, like you're trying to like real, go real deep in solving one thing. And I think that when you start, talking about like helping people find jobs or, um, you know, all the other side That's things later. that come next to finding debt. Like it's, I can mm -hmm. see that becoming like things get becoming very diluted and not very focused. Um, very blurry. So exactly. exactly. Yeah. Do one thing and do one thing really well. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. I mean, to yeah. attend to, to answer your question around where do people go to um, when they want to solve their debts normally. So, I mean, one thing I always talk about when it comes to when you're founding or starting or trying to solve a problem is somehow it, sh it should be something, it should be a problem you've experienced before because mm -hmm. you can't really solve a problem you haven't really interfaced with generally. I mean, well, the what, empathy how, level, right? exactly. how do you exactly? So, yeah. I mean, and also I've worked with um, a guarantee trust bank, one of the largest um, providers of personal loans in Nigeria, Quick Credit, a lot of us know them. And yeah. before I left GT Bank, I disbursed, I mean, I, I didn't contribute to the problem, but I disbursed over a billion naira in personal loans to individuals and businesses. And I have a perfect understanding of how people manage these loans. So, I mean, you would expect that a commercial bank or a lender would have, yeah. would have a, a personal finance section that helps people understand, oh, this is where your debt are, this is how you do them. It's like, nope, they don't. I mean, they are too big. They are too involved in getting their monies back. They are too involved in, they are too interested in giving you money. So and when it comes to- The more money you borrow from them, the more money they make. Exactly. So they want you to keep on getting more money. They want you to keep doing that. But how to change that behavior mm -hmm. and okay, how do you make sense of this data and how do you analyze them better so that the next time you're coming back, you are a better borrower. Yes, I mean, the, exactly. that part of the whole lending yeah. process flow yeah. is totally yeah. forgotten. And I've been in the yeah. financial space for about six years now and it's super amazing. You would expect that it's a field or that it's been covered, but it's not. People do yeah. this manually by themselves and generally, yeah. So, like, and I think the, the, the thing from both Caleb and myself is to is to double down on the psychology of the person that, and especially in behavior change, go do some heavy, mm -hmm. heavy research into how people can change behavior, what kind of gamification mechanisms need to be in place to change behavior, uh, scoring, mm -hmm. little little dopamine wins because you you understand who your keystone species is. So I think that's that's really what Caleb and I are saying is, is really understanding this human to the best possible place that you can. But we've got five minutes and I'm wondering, like, I mean, that was, thank you so much and for, for putting yourself. That's, awesome. that's good. The, yeah. It's okay. As, as the guinea pig for that. And, and, and so maybe we've got five minutes and we can look at Lynn. Did, the, did our ecosystem, while we get that up, did our ecosystem, guys, that you guys are listening on this call, 
um, and that are with us. Get, you guys got any insights for Lekan and, and what he's up to? Um, someone's already said that they really like your story and stories go a long way to building great value propositions. What If you guys have got any other suggestions for Lekan that, that he can add and, and build this up, it would be amazing. So pop it into the chat. Then we know you're struggling with your voice there. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, this is no, the loudest that's <laughs> <laughs> No, that's absolutely fine. Shave, sorry. Um, and uh, team, if we can just get Lynn's, um, oh, wait, I could probably. Lynn, can you pull your. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, your data? I can share. Yeah, okay. Can Thanks. Unfortunately, Lynn, you, you and I have worked together a little bit. So uh, I've got a little bit of insight and we can, I can fill, it, fill in the blanks for you. Okay. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen and you can go ahead. It does take a little bit of a while to load, by the way, depending okay. on your, yeah. Just let me so, know if you can see it. Okay, we will do. Um, still, still coming up. There we go. Amazing. It's a really beautiful deck um, going through this. So unifying 20 generations and improving standards of living. That's, that's a, a really big problem to solve, Lynn. That's a huge problem to solve. Um, improving standards of living. Um, amazing. Uh, very inspirational, right? Um, and then you want to scroll nothing through. Nothing shit, nothing gained. Yes. <laughs> and you're good. You, we do have a certain level of arrogance to believe that we can solve yeah. these big problems. And, yeah. and, you know, I think it was, it was Steve Jobs in his Apple poem that said those who are crazy enough to think that they can change the world are the only ones that do. So, you know, we're kind of in that boat. Um, our purpose, empowering communities through an innovative approach, empowerment and unity, what we do, unifying diverse generations, redefining experiences. Um, oh, I like how you've defined that what gold is. That's nice. Uh, <laughs> Wait, okay. Um, okay, very nice. Okay. Um, Just let me know when I need okay. to move on. Sorry. Okay, we will do. <laughs> okay. Can we create equal opportunities for better future transparent communication and feedback loops are central to communication? Okay, so there's lots of like big picture stuff going on here. Um, Caleb, any feedback here? Um, I still don't really know what it does. Like, can, the business can does. We keep going? Yeah. yeah, I feel like because it's an overview, yeah. it's a, maybe it's not as yeah. Um, yeah. clear, but. Yeah, okay. okay. All right, cool. You can move. Mission and vision. All right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We, cool. Yeah. Move. Yeah. Okay. So here's your context that you're building out. All right. Yeah. Unemployment, mm -hmm. financing, inflation, government debt. Okay. So this is these are the big picture problems. All right. Cool. Okay. Service and market size, disposable income, what is spent? ICP. Okay. All right. So I see in in the ICP space. Uh, oh, sorry. sorry. Ideal customer Ideal. profile. All yeah, oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. I thought we were listening at. Okay. okay. No, that's fine. Carry okay, on. Interesting market challenges. So certified at the experience. Challenging. We encounter challenging time consuming processes in their searches and resulting in frustration. Okay. Nice. Number of websites are overwhelming. Oh, Go pick one. Sorry. Yeah. And for oh. people to focus, questionable reliability. If they can be trusted, what they can be told. Okay. Appreciate your opinion. Everything in one place. Okay. So web app um, that's going to solve these problems. Easy to use, has like search engine problems. It's a good purpose driven commission system. Okay. All right. Coming I soon. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you really are sitting on like the, the secretive Peace kind time. of Yes. Okay. And, and that's because you want to defend a market position. Um, Correct. So, okay. so for us, um, so, you know, obviously just for, for full transparency, this is obviously a bit more of a sanitized version. Um, yeah. But, you know, because, yes, it is a first mover advantage. So we do okay. need to be quite stealth about what we're doing. And why are we doing it? So it is a bit vague, Caleb. I agree. It's very vague in what you're seeing. Um, but obviously, there's a reason for that, um, just for the wider audience, I guess. Okay. So you're so trying I, to say, right, your value proposition that you're sitting with is 
these are the problems that you're solving and you're not quite ready to give us how you're going how? to solve that Correct. just yet. Yes. Okay. Correct. Okay. So let's talk about the framing of the problems then as because that's what we can see for this um, specifically. Um, I think what you've got here is quite a vague statement. People are dissatisfied with their experiences. And I think maybe this is where you probably need to have a somebody, like an actual human, that's saying, I am dissatisfied with my experience. Maybe some actual video testimonial of people who are literally experiencing this problem and who can say it verbally. Um, because it's one thing, like I said, you know, draw what you see or draw what you think you see, is this is still being put through a filter of it's your filter applied to the thing. This is the experiences that we believe people have. Um, but if you can actually provide living testimony to saying this is how people are experiencing their whatever they're looking at, and you obviously still don't want to say what your where your competitors <laughs> sit and lie, because um, that might give away where where you're you're yeah. ending up. But this this is is almost assumption based i would like to see some more data around or, or some live testimonials to say this is what people have said the, their experience is kayla yeah i'd say the same like i think it's always more real when you're like um when you explain exactly exactly the problem someone has um and exactly the gap that exists and i feel like there, there were like a lot of like almost like um a lot of like features to the problem or like a lot of different problems um, that kind of, I feel, tried to come together to explain the solution. But really like what's important to see is like, where is the clear gap in, in what, what exists? Um, how, how have you validated that? And I think when it comes to validating, it's a bit less about like, it's actually a bit less about stats. Um, it's a lot more about stories, especially at the early stage. It's like, you're trying to tell a story about like why about the problem you're solving. Um, and you only really need to have impact with like one, two, three people at the beginning to really sell that story. Um, mm. So it might be like people don't like, um, I, I don't know, like people like don't, there's no way that people can find um, a job after they finish university. Um, let's say that's the problem. Uh, yeah. And I think yeah. just explaining that with stories is really easy to do. Like there's so many stories out there, you can put that on a deck. And then you say something like, we are building a way that people can finish their uni education and quickly get recruited into jobs through this. Um, and that's a very real, like I can I can see someone who's like experienced that. I, it actually makes sense to me because it's a story. Um, and I'm like, oh, okay, that makes sense as a solution. Whereas like using a lot of market uh, data is like a bit, um, it kind of takes away from the power of like uh, of what you're doing because it's just too much info. Yeah, exactly that. I think as soon as you can create a, a position, and that's what you want to do, you want to put the pe person who's viewing your value proposition, whether it be a pitch uh, for investment or a customer. You, what you want to do is be able to to provide the shoes within which they can stand, and that's through storytelling. Um, and so when you actually give the, the ability for them to empathize with an actual human who's experiencing this problem, it might not necessarily be one they have experienced, but if, if you can provide the shoes within which they can stand and view it from that perspective, you, you're already creating someone in, in your corner with you as opposed to someone on the opposite side of the fence that you're trying to explain something to. So I don't know, maybe that'll help. If, guys on the call, anybody else who's got any... Um, Additional information, questions from the audience um, that you you guys want to ask around this or any other questions that you have for us around that. Lynn, was that helpful? Yes, thank you. Okay. Obviously, being a little bit vague and you still want to hold that, that position might be a little bit difficult for us to give any other valuable input. <laughs> but Caleb, you have more? I have something I wanted to share. Just, just an example of like maybe a really clear ICP in a deck. Do you think it, I can yeah. spend like a minute just sharing that? Yes. Okay, it'll be really brief. Um, let me just try uh, presenting my screen. Um, uh, share screen. It does okay. take a while. This is still like under development. I've been, I was working on this deck last night actually um, with the founder. Uh, 
Cool. There we go. Cool. So it's a company in uh, Cote d'Ivoire. I actually invested, we invested last year um, and they're getting ready to do their seed. Um, mm -hmm. So here we have like, I think this is kind of exactly what we're talking about. And we spent a lot of time working on this yesterday. Um, the problem that they're solving is traditional, traditional insurance is broken for customers and insurers. Customers don't like struggle trusting and buying insurance. Sorry, um, mm -hmm. the team is, is uh, French, so like um, we're still working on the, okay. the finer details. Um, customers fail to trust and buy insurance. Insurers don't know how to get insured. Only 1% of Africans are insured. So here we've actually told you like both sides of the problem and like a stat that backs it up. And actually what we could do here is add in like another sentence, which just tells a story about how um, a customer just doesn't touch insurance because they don't trust mm -hmm. it. And then this graphic is is kind of like bringing we assure into the solution, um, and I think this like really precisely shows the value prop. So we're a one stop shop for insurance in Africa, connecting insurers to customers. Um, insurers like then we assure sits here, and then mm -hmm. like this is the text, like the solution, and then customers. And I think this graphic in itself is like almost the perfect example of a value prop, right? Like yeah. this, these two parts are disconnected. Um, this is where we sit and where we exist um, and, and mm -hmm. why, like, and what our value proposition is. Yeah, no, this is nice. And it's simple, right? As soon as, as, soon as you overcomplicate it and we, we, we'd love to get down into the details because that's where we live as founders. We live in those details and we thrive off of that. But when you can just simplify it down into something that, that anyone can understand through that, they don't always necessarily have to be your customers to understand it, but you've provided the, the perspective and the simplification with which to understand it. They don't necessarily exactly. have to have lived and experienced that problem. Exactly, yeah. And I think that's that's like yeah. as founders, we are very in the weeds. Um, okay, yes. we might round out here. Um, does anyone have any questions they wanted to ask before we Okay, this is interesting. I'm working with a tech organization whose aim is to support and train millions of women farmers in Africa, rural com communities, digital technology. What advice would you recommend? Um, in terms of building a value proposition for that, and this is where your empathy needs to come in very heavily, is if you can provide stories here um, to, to actually demonstrate the, the problem that these women are facing, and then how the solution can be provided to them and the resulting impact of that solution. Um, I, it looks like a type of business that probably would be a social uh, impact business. Um, and you'd have to look at the business model around this to see how it, it, are people that are paying, who are your customers, going to be the people that are your end beneficiaries as well. Because then your value proposition changes completely. Is that... The people that are paying are your customers. What need are you solving for them? And then who are the users and what need are you solving for them? And your value prop then has to have two different streams to it. Caleb, did you, are you with me on that? I, I think you, yeah, I think that's about right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think the value prop becomes a little different when you're working with, um, yeah, like whether it's a nonprofit or it has more of a social mm -hmm. flavor to it. Um, yeah, yes. I think you know it though, Lisa. Yeah. Okay, great. Are there credit scores in Lagos? Is it similar to us? I wonder. I'm talking more about the benefits after they use your platform would be good. Oh, Lekan, that's for you. So Shanice has given you some really good questions there to think about it. And then Godson Green has asked uh, for the slides in the chat. Um, the, up, a little bit further up is the Value Proposition Bible um, template, Godson, if you want to just click on the link and you can get that. Um, yeah, so I think let's wrap it up there if you're happy, Caleb, cool. or if there are any more questions. I have a people question want to ask. before we round out for everyone. So um, mm -hmm. if you're still tuning in, I would love to hear two things. One is, um, what's one thing you took away from this? Like one thing you took away from this session um, that you found to be really useful or insightful for your building? And then the second one, and please be honest, uh, we won't judge you at all. Um, out of like five, what would you rate this session? And you can give it like yeah. a, you know, one out of five, two out of five, three out of five, four out of five, five out of five, yeah. whichever one you, you genuinely would rate it. Um, we'd love to get your feedback. And again, we want this to be as valuable as possible. So um, yeah. So in the comments, yeah. uh, type in like one thing you took away from the session and out of five, your ranking. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, cool. So while you're doing that, uh, we want to just say that there's two things that Raise is going to offer you from this. Those that haven't got the value proposition Bible template, it is available and you can you can download it there. Um, the team will pop the link into the chat again, just so that you, you've got that front of mind. And then the second thing is that um, Raise has an equity clinic. It's a, a way of getting a corporate health score for your business. So as you're growing, often you don't know what you don't know. Like in value proposition, start with what you know. But when you move outwards, you often don't know what you don't know around your equity and how to structure it effectively for growth. Just like the value proposition is one of those levers that you pull for growth, so is your equity. And an equity clinic then gives you the ability to look at your corporate health and the structuring of it and how best to do that in order to grow. Um, Lynn's been through that process as well where she's learned about how, her equity and, and how to build that out. Um, so we've, we're offering you an equity clinic and, and there's a special event tech safari discount on that. So there's a 10% discount on that on a, a light equity clinic. It's usually $129. In fact, it's, it's more than 10%. We've offered you a $29. So it's at $100 if you want to do a light equity clinic and have a quick look at what is your corporate health score, how are you performing on it, and then where are the key areas that you can work in order to build out the, the sustainability of your corporate equity. So if you want to sign up for that, it's on the very same sheets that you download the value proposition template from. So if you can just pop onto that link, um, yeah, there will be, the, the link is in the chat a little bit further up, but the team will pop it in there as well. So yeah. Sounds good. Thank you. Maybe the, the link in there. And I, just to like re-up on the equity clinic, imagine like this session, but it's just about you and your company, like going really deep mm -hmm. into what you're doing. So that's like, you exactly. get an hour of that. So that's kind of the yeah. value. Uh, yeah yeah and you get a report out of it as well to say right this is something you can show investors too yeah totally i would definitely recommend it for anyone who's getting investor ready or is like like gearing up to that um beautiful i'll read out some of the takeaways and then and then we'll round out so we got some feedback um lubau gave it five out of five thank you sir appreciate that um kevin uh Value prop is your right to exist. Awesome. Um, Abraham learned what the value proposition is about. Gave it five out of five. Thanks. Um, Vladimir focused on solving a single core pressing problem, then branching out when needed. Three out of five. Thanks for being honest. Um, Shanice learned how to be more detail oriented when building a pitch deck and will be making more changes to the deck. Would give it a five. Um, pleasure. Great to have you, Shanice. Avayo stitched through. Okay. Itch through the lens of the listener. Um, speak to the pain, not simply list features. Love that. That's actually really mm. on point. Five out of five. Um, and yeah, Ona Mei Yang uh, gave it five out of five too. Team, thank uh, you so maybe. much. This yes. is brilliant. Yes. Um, any parting words, Lisa? I like think, I'm, guys, yeah. if you yeah, if you want to get in touch with us, obviously we want you. you you're following Tech Safari, um, but if you want to get in touch with us. You know, raise.africa is, is where you'll find us. Um, and we're here to support through building your business from launch to liquidity. So, yeah, let's make this ecosystem a lot more sustainable. And with in your value propositions, you know, focus on what problem you're solving and for who you're solving it for. And if you want any help and support, um, the team is here, not only just to get you through, you know, your, your structuring of your equity and, and equity management better, we're here to make your businesses more sustainable. So thank you. And team, Lekan, Lim, thank you so much for being our guinea pigs Thanks, today. Guys. We appreciate it. Uh, and Lynn, without your voice Great. and anything as well, like, thank you so much. Thank you for being available for us to do that. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Thanks, team. Bye. See ya. Thanks, yeah. team. Bye. Ciao, then. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Are we still? Well, hang on a sec. Still alive. <laughs>